Hey guys, what's up? It is week 271, and uh, I want to mention that I've been doing um, the the secret top 10. We'll come back. I have no turnaround on that. I have one recorded. I have another one planned for the season, you know, opener and stuff like that. But I just uh, I, I want to take care of 1980, to be honest. And the retro year, been doing a lot for that. I've technically hit the halfway mark, and um, some of the movies that I had already covered on here, I've been recording with some people. I have those recorded. I just need to edit them. Um, you'll see the other video popping up first this Sunday of Troy Howarth with City of the Living Dead. But remember that these are just very casual um, conversations. So sometimes they stray more into 1980 or, or that one strays into Fulci. Even complaining about social media because I'm old and I like to complain. So bear with that. But it, it's a general idea. The general whatever is to talk about a certain movie from 1980 that I've already covered on the show and just talk about their thoughts on 1980 and just wherever it goes. So I've got a bunch of people lined up, a bunch of them recorded already. So if you're looking um, and anybody that does podcast or anything like that, have seen a movie that's been covered on the show before from 1980 and, and interested, reach out to me, especially if we have a relationship and, and anything like that. So let's hop into the first movie of the week, and this is from Visual Vengeance, uh, technically their first release here, um, Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder in Hell, and that's a mouthful, I definitely wanted to make sure I said it right, aka the Japanese Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something, the Japanese Evil Dead, sorry about that, the Japanese Texas Chainsaw Massacre is another movie, um, Japanese Chainsaw Hell or something like that, Japanese Hell, getting all these confused, this is definitely... Um, <laughs> the Japanese Evil Dead. Uh, this was made in 1995. So if you think of, like the horror landscape in the 90s, you have stuff like Demon Knight, I believe, and Tales from the Hood, and even Seven is coming out out around that time. If you consider that a horror film or not. So that's kind of what's going on. So um, this is a, a dirt sheet movie, um, and I, I this is one of these ones that it's kind of hard to tell if it was. It's from the master tapes. It's probably shot on 16, and then there's no actual, you know, like H the foot film footage. So they edited it on tape, which is kind of like a lot of the things that like Saturn's Core, which are a lot of SOVs, or this Visual Vengeance seems to be doing. Now their other release that was put out was the Necrophiles, and they have Suburban Sasquatch. So they have like all these kind of SOV movies lined up. We also have like a, I said another company in like Saturn's Core that does that, or or Wild Eye, um, not Wild Eye is the kind of parent company of this one, but uh, SRS will put out a lot of SOV on uh, Blu-ray or cheap movies that never had a Blu-ray or, you know, mastered on tapes, whatever. That's the element. So they're kind of doing that. This is one that had an overseas release, but, uh, you know, it was, you know, some people aren't region free. It's hard to import. And it was just a DVD um, as far as I know. And if there was a Blu-ray, it was probably very expensive in German, one of those deals. But yeah, so it was really nice to see this get a Blu-ray release because it's one that I've always wanted to watch. Um, yeah, I, I am a fan of Evil Dead, of course, and I do like Japanese cinema for sure, um, especially during this time. So this story is kind of, a, it's 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 very Evil Dead, okay? And it's not the first one that has been heavily inspired by Evil Dead, and it won't, it won't be the last, right? That, that crazy, you know, very energetic, Sam Raimi-style filmmaking um, that a lot of uh, directors from this time do share. I would say that Peter Jackson even has that kind of style to a certain extent. And even in, like, the Hong Kong cinema at times, I would notice, like, Herman Yao seemed to have that energetic at camera movement and stuff or Don Coscarelli just tons of people right and it's just kind of an independent spirit and this is definitely here so essentially what we have here is a long time ago um this man's um uh, I, I don't remember exactly how this ends up, but essentially this house has been haunted because uh, an ex-lover or something killed herself in this house. And uh, the son finally goes in there, but he goes in there with this psychic priest and his uh, girlfriend who's like a reporter who's interested in the cult and everything like that. And this spirit attaches itself to the priest, um, the psychic, which is kind of funny to think the idea of a priest being possessed. And that's kind of what they do is this, they have to fight like the evil spirits. So you're kind of screwed. That's so well on that. You're like, who do we call the on possess a priest? Um, essentially. Essentially, what happens is it turns into a splatter fest of them trying to take out the priest. He gets messages from his father. And did I mention he's a bodybuilder? Well, he's definitely that. And that plays kind of a little part in this movie as well. Hence the title and everything like that. So a lot of it is just like these weird, crazy moments of him fighting against this possessed priest. There's a lot of body parts being removed. And then the body parts kind of coming together and also running around and like attacking him. You know, we, we've seen a lot of kind of uh, crazy stuff like this. So, yeah. 
and it does have you know the idea of like Japanese ghost stories where you go inside a house and you're kind of trapped by the ghost you can't leave yada 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 so yeah like um the splatter effects are fun they're low budget they're definitely from an older time for sure and uh they looks like they use some stop motion in here that I really enjoyed especially at the end when the blob character is revived that was some really fun stuff and exactly how the character looks too is just absolutely ridiculous like kind of a a bubble eye and they do fun things where like an eye will be poked out or and it'll push back or something like that and it'll be back in its socket like i said it's it's really you know just kind of like a do-it-yourself gore film and it's not like overly you know offensive or anything like that as far as you know like sexual content or sexually explicit stuff like that it's very kind of just a splatter kind of fun movie that i think a lot of people will kind of enjoy in this this vein um there's a lot of weapons used uh including weights um and a shotgun and there's a groovy um, uh, line said of course like i said this is very close to the evil dead picture but i enjoyed it and i enjoyed it um as far as splatter is concerned i've always been into that kind of stuff especially the kind of more fun splatter i like all kind of horror but the fun splatter has a certain charm to it especially from the 90s when uh you know the 90s a lot of people consider some of the worst stuff i, I don't think we got until like kind of bad horror films until like the late 90s early 2000s for a while i think we had some real weak stuff and there was only a couple gems that stood out there but as far as the special features are concerned we have an arc archival L, um, 1995 SD master from original tapes. New interview with director Shinchichi Fuzukazawa. Commentary track with featuring directors Adam Green and Joe Lynch. Of course, um, these guys have had a couple other commentary tracks. They did the Friday thir some of the Friday 13th movies. Commentary track with Japanese film historian James Harper. And uh, he actually had, like, he lives in Japan. He talks a little bit about the history of horror and what the possible inspirations are and that kind of stuff. He mentioned Shinya Tusakamato and stuff like that, which I can see, like, you know, Haruko the Goblin. Definitely, it's from the same kind of cloth. Um, then we have special effects video archival or uh, original archival trailers from japanese release archival image gallery behind the scenes image gallery outtakes visual vengeance trailers reversible sleeve featuring japanese home video art, liner notes by matt uh delisandro of horror boobs retro vhs sticker collectible mini poster all this kind of stuff in your vintage style laminated video star rental card which is cool because these visual vengeance releases have put in little like trinkets and stuff inside the releases there's a nice uh stuff with uh necrophiles as well but it's like if you look in here you have some stuff like just a little video card and and like stickers that you could put around your room <laughs> they really go out it makes it kind of a fun release and everything like that and this is an enjoyable one too and definitely deserves to be seen stateside um and I think that a lot of people will dig it. And it, it's got, like, it's short, too. It's an hour and, like, three minutes. So you're in and out. Um, doesn't really wear out its welcome, you know, if you're worried about being stuck in just, like, a very repetitive nature of a gore film or nothing like that. It, it doesn't wear out its welcome. So definitely check out Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder in Hell. Um, I always want to say from Hell on there. But, yeah, good stuff. Okay, the next up is the Giallo Essentials box set, Volume 3. Now this is the black box. We already had a red and a yellow box. Of course, now we're having the black box here. And what's really cool about this release is that um, the other ones had been uh, like single releases. They've already been out and everything like this. All these movies in here, it's the first time they've been on Blu-ray, especially stateside. Um, I don't think they've ever had Blu-ray releases. A lot of these movies, I've never seen home video releases for anything like that. So uh, it was very cool. And in fact... I'm unfamiliar with any of these movies. I've heard of them in title and seen their covers, but they've never had like a wide release here. So yeah, it's a very nice uh, hard box here. And I'll get into the first movie. We're going to review these separately, of course. And the first one up is Smile Before Death, a film by Silvio Amadio, who did Amok, I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken. And this one is kind of like your, uh, I, I guess it's kind of like a gaslighting story. And I've been seeing a lot of movies with gaslighting in there, and not all of them are handled wonderfully. They become repetitive. This one is a little bit different than that. There's a lot of twists and turns, and it was very much cut from the same cloth as the Carol Baker and Berto Lenzi films, the kind of early Euro thriller giallos, where, you know, there's a lot of, you know, um, goth in the sense that it's like family you know betrayals and rich people and and that kind of seedy incest and stuff like that and smile before death is a hundred percent kind of in that vein here uh you know aristocratic rich people and just being sleazy pieces of crap second third fourth husbands and wives and all this kind of stuff so essentially the plot follows uh daughter returning home to kind of um to, because her mother had just been uh killed in, in the very beginning um in kind of a brutal way with her throat slit 
Um, but it kind of looks like a suicide. It's really, you know, iffy as hell, right? Um, and so uh, she, she ends up meeting her, like, fourth or fourth, um, her mom's fourth husband. And uh, the actress, Rosabella, she's in a bunch of stuff. You recognize her right away if you've seen any Jelly or Euro films. And uh, she's younger than the, the husband. And, like, you can tell they're kind of an item. And they kind of take her under the wing. And then they're talking to her, and like it's it's obvious that they're up to something. They were involved with her death. There's also kind of a you know um, uh, uh, like a maid that's around too that's very suspicious. So they start to fill the daughter's head in with everything like that. And as it goes on, you kind of catch on what this daughter is starting to manipulate the situation and stuff, and you learn more pieces to the puzzle. The one thing that I have to mention is the score. It's got this really upbeat, bizarre score to it that's placed throughout the entire movie. It's equally addicting and equally annoying. I enjoy it, but you know you could just see it constantly playing it's like, and, and like it'll definitely get stuck in your head it's memorable um so this one goes places that are pretty insane because the the daughter is supposedly like 15 she's about 16 years old and they're worried she's coming of age right so they're gonna lose the inheritance that they were just got which is is awesome but um the rosabella in this um she, she's like a photographer so like they get into this like weird stint where they're taking nude photos of her in this weird artistic way and like the the, the stepfather is like it just gets real much and gross and all that kind of way of course it's like high class at the same time so it's that sleazy seedy underbelly and high class stuff that is just kind of what the gels are made for this is a solid gel I, I liked it quite a bit um, so and the special features are as follows we have there's Eng you can listen to this one in English or Italian not all of them are in English and Italian some of them have not had a dub or they do not have the dub on here then we have a brand new audio commentary with authors and critics Troy Haworth and Nathaniel Thompson that's always a treat of course uh, they do a good job they do mention the score quite a bit original italian english front and end titles smile of the hyena brand new video interview with stefano amito film journalist and son of director silvio Elmato. Amadio. Never before, never before seen extended nude scenes not used in the final film. And that kind of includes some lesbian scenes, kind of elongated and anything like that. But yeah, this is a really solid movie. Not gratuitously gory or anything like that, but it has plenty of twist. And the ending twist, I was like, we're doing that. That's what's happening. And then we have like two or three added on top of that. Because like, uh, so many of the giallos have like these generation like divides in here where it's like old people taking advantage of young people or young people taking advantage of old people. It's always in there. And it's always like sexual situations. And, and the ending originally in this, I had seen like three or four times, right? If you watch any Umberto Lenzi movies, I don't want to say the movies because it will spoil it for it. it. Just involves car accidents. And you're like, okay, yeah, this is a Lenzi 101 or Giallo 101 or even probably I'm assuming Hitchcock 101. But at the very end of this, there's a couple twists at the end. And it's just, it kind of bumps it up to the point. And there's like a little, little sting of cruelty. Um, and I was like, that's really well done. So it, it made it a pretty solid giallo. I liked it before. And then the ending, I was like, ah, and then I was like, you won me over because you did something a little different. That I didn't expect. So that's good stuff. That is smile before death. Also a great title when you incorporate all the uh, fashion model stuff. So good movie. I, I would really recommend people that are big fans of giallos checking it out for sure. Okay. The next one up from the giallo essentials is the weapon, the hour and the motive. And uh, this director here, I think this is their only directorial film, or at least their only uh, horror thriller one. And I must admit, this one is, what, 72 as well? This is my favorite of the three. I was actually really kind of taken back at one scene in the film um, involving, uh, you know, what is that, self-flagellants? Or um, when they when the um, religious people beat themselves uh, for their, you know, their transgressions, um, they whip themselves. And, and there's a scene in this where it, it just is like, it, it's almost like an exploitation hell moment where I was like, I can't believe this is in here. It's beautifully shot. And it's just, it was very intense. And I was just taken back. I was like, boy, oh boy. So uh, essentially what we have here is, is something a little different for the Italian horror film or jolly or thriller. Um, usually you have priests killing kids or, or in these horror, in these kind of genre films this way around we have a priest who's killed in the very beginning now i, I assume that there's some religious figures killed and stuff like the um what's the one in the name of the rose and you know the rosary murders and stuff like that but it, as far as italian films are concerned they do mention this in the commentary um uh it's a uh, who what's the uh, lady who does the commentary andrea heller nichols she's very intelligent she kind of approaches her commentaries at kind of like i would say almost like uh you know a historian very intelligent about it and stuff like that and enjoyed that commentary but, um, so she mentions this, and right away when I was watching this, I couldn't help but think, who saw her die? 
and Don't Torture a Duckling are the first two that come to my mind when you think religious kind of thriller giallos or, or have those aspects in here. And it's definitely in here. So it takes place kind of like at this, it's just oh, surrounded by a lot of religious figures, nuns and priests. And in the very beginning, this this priest, you know, he as is, you know, he, he he's sleeping around with these women and he breaks it off with a couple of them. And he's promptly murdered, like right after. And we kind of enter this police officer, this detective who starts to kind of investigate and he starts to get involved with one of the women that, you know, this priest was involved with. And we're, we're kind of breaking the story down and all this kind of stuff. And there's a, there's a young child that's kind of snooping around there and, and, and plays in this nice little kind of plot device or with the marble and going down and all this kind of stuff plays out but there's just these reveals in this one like I said the the you know the self-punishing stuff that I thought was just it leagues a little bit you know took it to that next step of you know just filmmaking and, and guts you know it had guts and just some some really kind of explicit stuff for this movie and it's not like you know you're not going to be putting it in and seeing something like you know extremely graphic but I was just taken in context for the time and from where it's from and everything and I said wow that's that's pretty intense stuff here um, the acting I think is solid some of the camera work I thought was really fun so they do this a couple times where you have all the characters sitting around a table and it gets really kind of like intense where they're all talking and it will go around and, and there's a lot it's it's subtitled this one is completely subtitled you can't watch an English show when you have that kind of moment you're like it's hard to keep up with all these characters but uh, you know the detective uh, is really charming and uh, slick and stuff like that I enjoyed that and like you kind of feel Figure that it has to be one of a couple characters are possibly you know involved with this um and, and and the reveal is almost kind of sad to be honest but I, I would recommend checking this one out i think this is the best of the three and as far as the features are concerned like i said we have a commentary with alan um uh, alexandra heller nichols and then we have a man uh in a jello brand new video interview with actor salvador puntillo front and end titles for the lost english language dub oh so we see it's a lost english language dub so there was one originally, but we lost it. I figured that something like that. And Reversible Sleeve featuring original newly commissioned artwork by Peter Strand. So, yeah, this one I, I really thought was quite excellent, to be honest. And I think most people will as well if you're into Jolly, especially the kind of religious aspects. Like I mentioned, the Italian um, Euro horror films in general just handle kind of like their... Um, you know, judging of religion and Catholicism much better than the American counterparts of the time. For the most part, there's exceptions to every rule, right? But yeah, check out it. The Weapon, the Hour, and the Motive. And the final of the Gialli Essentials uh, Volume 3 box set is The Killer Reserve Nine Seats. And this is very much uh, Agatha Christie style story, like Ten Little Indians. But it's also the most supernatural of the three. It's also the most gothic of the three. And it's also the most horror of the three because of the supernatural aspects, most definitely. And the kind of just style and picking them off. So uh, what we have here is this kind of rich uh, gentleman. And he's having all these people come to this old like theater that his family owns. And it's been closed down because there were some really bad things that happened over the years forever in this place. And no one should go here, yada, yada. And there's some reveals about what happened in this story. And you're like, why, the, why are you here? It's just almost like they're drawn to it. So there's definitely a supernatural aspect. And there's some familiar faces among the people who are here, including Janet Argan from City of the Living Dead from 1980. And she's in Eaten Alive. And she's in a slew of other films, of course. Um, and uh, Howard Ross, uh, another kind of Fulci guy, who pops up in New Gladiators and New York Ripper and a slew of other ones, uh, Five Dolls for an August Moon. Just a really strong guy. I like to think of him as the Italian William Smith, which is a compliment, of course. So, um, so we have all these different people in here. We have like a lesbian couple. We have an ex-wife of this guy we have a new young girlfriend we have a, um, a daughter and her husband so we have all these characters in here and they all end up somebody tries to drop something on him at one point and um, he realizes that everybody here could possibly be a suspect and he's just like nobody here likes me and before long they know they're locked in here and they start to get picked off here and there um, there's a couple parts that made me laugh hysterically um, because one of the characters is gets in a fight Some somebody sees this person fight after somebody is murdered already um, sees this character in a fight and and they say that they saw them wrestling with someone, masked person. They come back and this person um, has, has been hung, uh, hanged, hung. I never know which one's the right pronunciation. It's the post, whatever, you know, uh, whatever thing. So um, one character actually has the nerve to argue. He's like, well, they hung themselves. You didn't see anything. You're in hysterics. It's like, this is nonsense. Like, I would have punched that guy right in the square in his face. It's like, this is absurd. This is absurdity. So, of course, they're picked off here and there. Most of the kills 
levels are a little tame. There is one fairly graphic one, and it's got the whole ordeal where it's like uh, almost legend where history must repeat itself, and you find this old document that's like, here, this is happening, this is happening, so you can kind of know what to expect throughout the entire movie. There's, of course, some twist at the very end, and uh, yeah, I thought this one was decent, solid, um, you know, pretty good, and more of the horror-oriented one. Like I said, there is a supernatural curse kind of aspect to the whole ordeal. So as far as special features are concerned, we have a brand new audio commentary by author and critic Kat Ellinger. Gotta love that, of course. And then we have Hanging with Howard, a video interview with actor Howard Ross. Writing with Biagio, a video interview screenwriter Biagio Prodietti. Um, Italian a theatrical trailer in Italian with English. And a reversible uh, commissioned artwork by Haunt Love. So uh, yeah, very cool. Great set. Um, three Jollies I have not seen. And there's so many jellies out there, and there's so much stuff that has not been released. And there is more uh, Italian horror films that are not made by the masters that everyone knows in America. You know, uh, Argento, Baba, Fulci, um, Lenzi, Martino, Diodato, um, you know, uh, Margariti. There's a lot more directors than these guys. and uh, But um, it's cool to see, you know, a couple one-offs and everything like this. And these three, this is this is kind of the stuff I love. And we also have, like, the Vinegar Syndrome putting these Gialli uh, box sets out, too. So it's nice. It's nice. And this one was probably one of my favorite boxes just because it was three solid Giallis I did not see. And they're put together, just like I said... Um, Arrow's been really good about making these like sets, like the Years of Lead, and putting them into context or Vengeance Trails, the Italian, the Spaghetti Western one. Like that was so cool. Like they'll have like one or two titles that you're interested in, but you end up having the whole set. You watch all of it, and you're like, these are all cool. And they paint a picture, and they're like in context, and it, it's just well done. Especially like the Years of Lead really impressed me because it also learned a little bit about Italian history, and that's uh, that's uh, that's always good. You know, I am old. So I'm like that guy from Monster Squad, like the teacher's like, I think science is cool. I do like learning, especially about film. So it's always nice. Anyways, Jolly Essentials, Jallo Essentials. Is it Jallo? It's Jallo. Some people don't think Jolly is technically a term that should be used. Uh, I don't care. I'm not getting paid for this. This is for fun. <laughs> so check this one out. And I know my friend Duncan McLeish is going to have to have this box set as well because he's he's got the red. He's got the yellow. You got to have the black. You got to have the black one too. Okay, so this next one is the debut, the American debut of 101 Films. They're a UK company. They're getting over here releasing stuff, which is very cool. Because after this release, their next release is Ghostwatch, which I don't think's ever had a proper uh, DVD release here. Most well, certainly not a Blu-ray. But their first one, which is the first uh, Blu-ray release of it, is The Last Broadcast. This was widely available in UK, but now it's here in the States. Um, the Last Broadcast was made in 1998, the same year as The Blair Witch Project, and it didn't get the marketing The Blair Witch Project got, but it's very similar shares a lot of the same DNA. Um, essentially, it is the plot about uh, a group of, you know, kind of like public access, access television. You know, they make this show, and they're making a show about the Jersey Devil. It's kind of low-rent TV. There's a there's a handful of uh, young men that go out there. Uh, three of them disappear. They go out, and one person comes back. They find two bodies. They blame him for the murders. Now, this is kind of a, a documentary and looking back at the case with the footage and, and analyzing it and telling people what he thinks happened and all this stuff, and there's, there's a great reveal at the end. So, the last broadcast... I had seen this one once before, and I thought it was really great. Um, now, it always is going to be directly compared with The Blair Witch, you know, which is, is unfair and fair at the same time. You know, it's definitely from that vein. Um, the one thing that I really found impressive by the filmmakers was um, when they were interviewed for this, um, they instead of, you know, saying that, you know, The Blair Witch ripped this off and so much, or, or they could they could have went down that road, right? And these guys said, you know, I don't think that... No, anybody got the idea from anybody. It was just kind of in the conscious collective, you know, the collective consciousness. And it was just that kind of thing was going to happen. And, and they had more marketing and yada, yada, yada. We didn't have it. and But he doesn't seem bitter. Like you, these people that made this, it could be very bitter because this movie, to me, I, I watched Blair Witch when it came out. It's been a long time. I need to revisit. But I've always, I, I thought this was a great movie. And I still think it's a great film. And it does something that a lot of found footage movies don't really do. And and, and I would say something like Strangeland, which is around the same time, kind of addresses as well. So when you see this movie and there is a reveal, without spoiling too much, it brings up the idea of, you know, interacting with people via online. People that you cannot see. People that you do not know. And... Those people possibly being able to set you up, knowing where you are, and hurt you in a way. And that, that that's kind of the reveal in the last broadcast, that there is that idea that, you know, there's a possibility that somebody that you don't know 
has all bad motives and they know where you're going to be at and stuff like that and just can manipulate the situation, which is so funny now because if you look at people nowadays on the internet, they post everywhere where they're at. Though here's where I'm eating right now. I'm out of vacation. I'm on vacation. Your house is all this kind of stuff, and it's just like everybody does it. So many people do do it. So it's just a kind of a, a crazy thing to be brutally honest. But that idea of you know somebody behind some a name and that's all you see it is very very creepy and of course this is done kind of like a, a true crime documentary from the 90s so it has that like cheap quality about it and the editing and it will just do repeat things like that again like a director who does that that i really enjoy is um the director who did um no roy the the curse no roy the curse and occult he does that and he handles that stuff very well when you add a sense of realism to him and like repeating these lines and stuff just they uh you know kind of something in the very beginning do the jersey devil and then it pops back up and pops back up is very creepy. Um, so it also shows, you know, the idea of, you know, uh, people blaming someone for a crime and, and all these loose ends on the crime and, and diving into it, you know, and that's be interesting. Like in, in the sense of a horror film, for me, a lot of the times, if you put a good mystery in there to figure it out and you figure it out with, you know, the people in the movie, it's always it's always rewarding to me. It very much keeps my attention because I'm personally trying to figure it out myself, you know, and, and it just like adds that layer of realism. Like this one seems genuinely real in, in a lot of ways. And then the reveal. Originally, I was a little iffy on the reveal in this film, but I think now I, I've grown to be expect it and I, I like it and, and, and I could see the setup and points like that and I really do like it but uh, yeah, generally this is a, is, a, is a well done film it's edited in a way that seems genuinely realistic for the time um, it's very much 90s and, and I mean that as a compliment because you know, in this way um, I, you know, I was born in 86 so I was 12 when this movie came out, I didn't initially see it when it came out it took years after, but the idea of seeing how they handled the edited stuff I definitely seen programs like this growing up. Um, so like, uh, I, I do think that the first two acts are a little stronger. Um, I do, uh, the setup the, you know, the intrigue of the story and trying to figure out. And as of course it gets closer to the moment, the ideas, the, the possibilities are slimmer. So it's not as, you know, um, but yeah. Uh, so like, it, it's just also interesting to see like how they paint somebody guilty that possibly couldn't be guilty, all this kind of stuff in there. Um, so as far as the special features are concerned, there was, um, uh, the couple of things like I said that I found interesting were the interview with the filmmakers and especially them just being very candid about you know not being they didn't seem bitter although they maybe it's very disappointing that this happened right um, two movies that simultaneously have very similar ideas and styles and everything like that and one is you know catapulted into mainstream and the other is you know I don't want to say doomed to obscurity but for a long time it was I mean it's become more of a cult item right I know Blair Witch is a cult film as well but there's two different cults I guess right cult films right um so um, at, at this point like that and, and also another beautiful kind of moment I thought was really good was seeing like how they captured a lot of the uh, interviews with random people like so they use like they would just film these people and kind of like give them basic kind of lines it seemed like and they would just like film them for long periods of time and like uh, a lot of that came across poor you know they'd mess up their lines they were just kind of not and they weren't real actors but they said the way they edited this, the way like they would say, you know, a lot of it was crap, but then they would get a moment of genius in there. And you can see that because while you watch the film, you don't notice any negative things about the performances at all. As far as, you know, the people being interviewed are that are talking about the case. But while you watch that footage with the with the bloopers and everything in there, you're like, this looks like kind of a mess to deal with. But, you know, they obviously had some editing chops and they had a good vision what they wanted to do. Um, the release has a booklet in here with lots of great stuff. It has two discs. Um, one is, in, of course, uh, it's a Blu-ray. The, the picture quality is not going to be great on this thing, right? Um, because it was shot in a certain way from a certain time. But uh, I, I think it looked as good as it possibly could. Um, the sound mix, you know, the sound mix is creepy in here. A lot of the digital stuff and stuff works really well. But uh, there's a lot on the second disc, um, a lot of features on here. Um, so it, the standard additional extras, there's not extra disc, but SD. It's an, an SD, not an HD. Sorry about that. We have a commentary by the filmmakers, and then we have behind the scenes post production, um, production and uh, distribution, exclusive interviews, factor fiction, rare clips from the infamous public access show. Because these characters in here run a public access show, and like so, there's lots of footage of them being goofy and stuff like that. Jim Seward, alive and well, performing two folk songs. Lucas, what really happened? Gallery of Gore, Pine Barrens, murder, crime scene, and autopsy 
images, last podcast, last broadcast, poster, and box art from around the globe. Yeah, and like I said, also, um, the idea of being in the Pine Barrens is scary as shit. So, really recommended. I'm um, glad 101 uh, Films is doing that. We have, so like I said, we have some more of these labels popping up in the States. Uh, Visual Vengeance, 101 Films. Um, and uh, I know that, like, um, geez, 88 Films has been doing really well in the States as well. So, yeah, it's it's like almost like you're being like uh, it's super rewarding to be a film uh, collector or fan right now. So many good releases, so many good films getting great releases too. So yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so for the Patreon pick, Dan the cameraman said, "Do a director na- uh, with your name, David or Dave, that you haven't seen any of their films or covered on your show, or I haven't seen any of their films." So the only directors I could find were the guy who did Into the Grizzly Maze, and I I, I was going to do that one, but then I saw that uh, David Ayer did this one called Fury, which I've had and I never watched, and I hear good things about it. I love war films, especially, you know, like, uh, you know, World War II films, all that kind of stuff. I'm into them. And this had a really good cast. Brad Pitt, you know, Brad Pitt has done so many good films in, in over the years, too. And as he gets older, he, he makes even great, he makes great choices, too. You know, um, from, from uh, what is Once About a Time in Hollywood, this one, he's just always popping up, and it's just like, oh, shit, that's Brad Pitt. So it's usually going to be a pretty solid decision. Also, we got Shia LaBeouf in here, who I'm not as familiar with. I've seen him in, what, um, the Nymphomaniac movies, and he does fine. I mean, he's never, I've never seen him do a poor job. I'm just not as familiar with his acting ability. Um, of course, Michael Pena, who I know from, you know, more comedic elements, but, um, you know, that's always good to have that kind of character in a war film because, you know, everybody goes to war at the time. And we have John Berthall, who I know from Walking Dead and the Punisher television program. Um, regardless of The Walking Dead, you know, he was always doing a solid job. No matter how you feel about the movie, I thought he always did a great job in it, or the show. And he was a good Punisher, and I've always kind of enjoyed his performances. So, and we also, this actor up here is the new kind of character that pops in here. I don't know their name off the top of my head. I know I'm a piece of crap. There's also some other familiar faces in here. You'll notice Jason Isaacs from Patriot, and Clint Eastwood's son, Scott Eastwood, is in here. You'll recognize that, those cheeks, anywhere, um, definitely in Eastwood. <laughs> Same thing for Francesca Eastwood. You can spot the Eastwoods anywhere. They have those huge cheekbones. So, okay, Fury. Um... You know, it had a two-hour and 13-minute runtime, which is not too extremely long for a war film. And I'm not 100% sure if this is based on a true story, but I do know that they um, they did interview a lot of the people that from World War II that um, were in the tanks, the tank division. So this follows a tank, which is also something I'm not too familiar with. You know, um, Oddball from uh, Kelly's Heroes, Donald Sutherland was in the tank, but it wasn't about the tank. So, a uh, battle of bulge head tanks, but it wasn't. I, I feel like that might have been more about tanks. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie. I'm not sure if I've ever seen the entire entirety of Battle of the Bulge, just television and stuff like that. I just remember Telly Savalas in a tank, okay? That's all I remember. So, here we go The Fury, or Fury. That's the name of the tank. Um, we have this group of guys that seem to have been together forever. In the very opening, they lose somebody, so they're very sour, and they're assigned, you know, your typical young guy. Um, you've seen that happen in a lot of movies, like Platoon. They'll usually have that point of view of a new character coming into something, so you can relate to them, right? So you can be like, I'm the new, you know, you're seeing all this, and kind of be in that situation. They even do it, and um, you kind of up them in Saving Private Ryan, right? Jeremy Davies, who is, you know, I'm familiar with this. And this character is in that kind of vein. Um, he's treated like crap right away by everybody and you have all these kind of like very one-dimensional seemingly characters you got the guy they call coon ass or something that's john berthold he's like very much a, just kind of your hillbilly kind of character and then you have michael pena who's like um just like kind of like uh you know they call him gordo because he's a heavy like a mexican guy and he always talks in spanish and every once in a while shia labeouf is called bible because he's very religious and and brad pitt's kind of like the stern kind of boss but he seems tough but he seems mysterious but all this kind of stuff and you're just like they're very generic and one-dimensional and their dialogue it's it's very on the nose like you could predict their next lines and everything like that and i started thinking man it's a little too obvious for me right off the bat but as it progressed the characters started to morph into more two-dimensional characters and everything like that and that's i i don't know if that's purposely done you know the idea that you are initially introduced to these characters and you think that they're very you know uninteresting or, or very annoying or abrasive which they are but as it goes on you start to see like underneath you know their tough exterior and there's some you know a, a group of people that banded together to survive and war is tough all this kind of stuff it starts to come together right and by the middle of it i was really connected to the characters i connected to the unit and everything and there's some really good dialogue which i didn't you know i wasn't too sure it was going to be there and they have this catchphrase the best job i ever had best job they all say that and it just gets these moments when they're in there and they have these extreme moments of fighting and and it's just like you know it, it's touching um, there's also these other characters that are in the tank units and stuff like that. 
Um, that, and that's, that's entertaining too. I mean, they do the typical Lieutenant Wolf from Platoon thing, which just happens in a lot of these movies where you have the com- initial commanding officers, very young and very just, you know, was an officer probably, you know, put in that spot, doesn't know what he's doing, does not like anything. That's very typical in war films. You always have a younger character who's in charge, doesn't know what the fuck they're doing and get, you know, and this doesn't last too long. So, um, actually I think that was the actor from, um, the, the, the crazy, um, what's the... The loved ones. I think it was the the young guy in that movie. To be honest, if I'm not mistaken, Xavier is uh, Xavier Samuels or something. That might have been him. So as it goes on, like I found myself really attached to the characters, and you know kind of where it's going to go, and it's going to have this big major battle at the end, the last stand. Um, and it has these like obviously these touching patriotic moments, which you kind of expect on a war film. Some people would probably not want to see you know something they'd be like this is. Uh, propaganda, patriotic propaganda. It's World War II, guys. We're fighting Nazis at this time. Fuck a Nazi. Um, any Nazi. Uh, the only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. Um, so, like, there's this element of, you know, like, uh, like where the character doesn't want to do what he's doing, and, and eventually he joins. And they all, have, like, he gets his name and stuff. Like, it's just a lot of cool moments. Like, there's one scene that I couldn't believe was in there because it, I just was like, are we doing this, really? Very obvious, like, kind of fall in love scene and then the initial outpack. Like, and, and like, it just all happened so fast that it seemed trite and cheap. But then at the same time, I think that's just their point that, that things happen very fast in war. War is cruel. Um, just a little too on the nose at times, to be honest. But at the end of it, like I said, this won me over big time. I like the characters quite a bit. And uh, I am a, a fan of war films. So I really dug this one. And Brad Pitt's great. Brad Pitt's really good in this. He's And uh, he's an interesting character. And uh, actually... Thought Shia LaBeouf had some really good moments too, and John Berthel. They all had their moments to shine. All the characters in here, and I all thought they did a really good job. I mean, basically just five people in a tank for a lot of it. Um, they do face off against a tiger tank, and everybody knows um, in World War II, tiger tanks were pretty fucking well made. So when it comes to the American tanks, um, yeah, they're not really up to snuff. But there's a really intense scene where three American tanks face off against a tiger tank, and let's just say only one tank leaves the field. Um, yeah. So, anyways, uh, a fury. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Would watch again. Um, recommended for sure. There's over 50 minutes of deleted and extended scenes. Now that 50 minutes could add possibly, you know, some more context, and maybe it would feel a little less uh, on the nose and, and rushed if we had that kind of aspect. But that would put this over at three hours, which I don't really have a problem with. Um, but so, and there's the blood brother. Brothers cast and crew discussed the herring experience of filming a tank together. That is nice. Um, but I like the uh, the stuff where they sat down with the uh, vets because the vets would, and they're old. You know, these vets aren't going to, they probably are all dead now. I mean, this was 2013. There's been, I, I highly doubt any of them are alive. They were in their 90s. I mean, there's probably not very many World War II vets at all, period. Uh, and I don't think there is. I mean, how many? One, two, maybe, if that. But anyways, uh, interesting movie, good stuff. Um, and you don't see too many uh, war films in, in this caliber anymore, to be honest. And um, uh, yeah, I, I would recommend checking this one out if you haven't seen it. I liked it. All right, now it's time to hop into those 1980 movies. And I know what you're thinking. Dave, how are you going to follow up the F- uh, Fury with another you know, war movie that's up to snuff with it? On the same caliber. Same filmmaking. Same fucking everything about it. Maybe even better, Okay. That's going to be The Last Hunter from 1980. More of an exploitation movie, but it, here's, the, here's the thing. It's an Italian exploitation movie about Vietnam starring David Warbeck as an American, even though he's not American. It's also got some memorable people in here. And, um, geez, Tisa Farrow from Zombie and Fingers and Anthropophagus. And uh, um, she's on me all costs? I don't remember. Uh, but it's also got Tony King, my boy Tony King from Cannibal Apocalypse, Raiders from Atlantis, Bobby Rhodes. Gotta love Bobby Rhodes from Demons. And uh, The Great Alligator, I believe he's in that as well. John Steiner, who I absolutely love. He's in Cut and Run. He's in Tenenbrae. He's in Caligula, for Christ's sakes. Massimo Malvani, who's always the stunt guy in all of Bruno Mattei's movies. He's in a bunch of movies. He's in Robo War. And uh, yeah, it's just got a nice little cast in here. It's also got um, the actress from, gee, she's at uh, Hell's Living Dead. She pops up in here. Um, yeah, so um, this is directed by Antonio Margariti. I always mispronounce his name. But Antonio Margariti, you know, he did four Vietnam movies. Um, and that's crazy to me. Two in 1980, um, one of which is Cannibal Apocalypse with Tony King and Giovanni Lamberto Radici, John Saxon. Great movie. Love it. Of course, you guys know that. And then he also did Tiger Joe with David Warbeck and Tony King. And he did another one called The Last Tornado, which is also a, a pretty good film as well. All four of them are pretty cool. Um, and so this one, you know, it'd been a while since I watched it. I remember it being very violent, very crazy. So David Warbeck is on a special mission. Um, 
essentially they're throwing him into the jungles of Vietnam to complete this mission. He's got to take out this radio communications tower that's spitting propaganda that, you know, that's destroying the Americans' morale like they needed that in Vietnam anyways, right? I mean, fuck, morale's got to be super low according to Vietnam movies, right? <laughs> so here we go. Um, who better to tell a story about American Vietnam in 1980 than an Italian guy? I, I I enjoy those movies and I like seeing other perspectives about it but this like you know so you have all these characters in there Tony King and Bobby Rhodes are kind of like the main guys that are with him the entire time and like people are getting picked off in super gory details um, and we have this reporter uh, with him as well in Tisa Farrow so as it progresses you know uh, more characters get picked off and there's this big set piece where like they land at this military base where all the guys are just super over the top basically filthy animals trying to rape Tisa Farrow and they're all like stereotypical weird looking guys and, and like there's some overdubbing that's insane like you hear like the same line four times it's like don't be gross don't be gross don't be gross and you're like oh, fucking hell like so at points you're like this is a little chintzy but at the same time it's also brutal and there's some cool shit about it so i really enjoy this one like i said um but it does stop in that that base for a long time and you're introduced to this like whole group of characters led by john steiner um, and like the movie stops to do this whole entire stunt scene where Massimo Vanni has to get this coconut and it's like 10 minutes scene where he's running across the jungle to get a coconut because he's being punished or it's like a, a weird bet. You can see how these guys have kind of lost their mind. And what happens is, you know, of course the base is attacked and there's a body counts to the roof. Almost every character that's introduced gets killed. Um, Tony King, I love in here. Okay. And Bobby Rhodes. I'm, I'm a fan of those guys. Um, and they're awesome in this one. And uh, so, yeah, David Warbeck is solid in here as well. Um, and the very end's pretty intense, pretty memorable ending, to be honest. Um, like, I, I don't want to spoil everything about the movie, but it's pretty cool. There is a reveal, and there's like a flashback, which is funny to me. It's very much like Fistful of Dynamite, um, the Sergio Leone movie. And if I'm not mistaken, it's been years, but David Warbeck is the actor who's in that flashback in Fistful of Dynamite, or Duck You Sucker, whichever you prefer. He's in that flashback, which is about, you know, uh, two friends, somebody remembering their best friend, and then they die. And David Warbeck's like in this flashback, remembering remembering his best friend and then they die in the very beginning of the movie so it's just like this is weird like i wonder if they were like we're gonna recreate the duck you sucker scene because sergio leone's the best and antonio Margarita's doing it too i don't know i don't know if that's just a very common trope or whatnot in a lot of the vietnam movies in here but anyways uh the last hunter good shit check it out recommended um it's a code red a blu-ray i think you can pick it up at kino's website but there are some special features on here brand new interview with to stars Tony King and John Steiner. Um, they put him in here directed by Anthony M. Dawson. Gotta love that. So anyways, uh, good stuff. If you're into Vietnam War movies uh, made by Italians. Okay, the next one up is another one from 1980, and it's He Knows You're Alone. This is a Screen Factory Blu-ray, and it had been a long time since I watched this movie. Um, so, I, so I was definitely going to rewatch it for 1980. This is actually directed by Armin Mastroni. I, I mispronounced his name. But he also did another one called The Killing Hour, which I remember uh, being really sleazy with Perry King. Solid, solid kind of slasher thriller movie. He also did, um, he has two more, Cameron's Closet and uh, The Supernaturals, which is a fun kind of zombie flick. You know, I believe Civil War kind of people coming back and fighting like a, a group of new recruits or whatnot. Um, fun kind of horror film. So he's got a couple kind of genre movies, kind of under under talked about guy. Um, he knows you're alone. It's probably not doing him too many favors. Okay. I like slasher movies, 1980. Yeah. Um, after Halloween, we had a lot of Halloween kind of inspired, uh, movies or, and then we had Friday 13th and we had even more Halloween and Friday 13th inspired movies. And I, I have no problem with Ripoffs, right? I like Bruno Mate. What am I saying? Right. But so he knows you're alone and, and watching this, I was just shocked how much people like this lifted from Halloween. So uh, basically what we have here is um, there is a killer that goes around and kills women on their, that are going to get married. Real real good motive for a killer in a movie that's scary, that's mean-spirited, it's fucking bizarre. So he basically kills women that are going to get married. There's a cop that lost his fiance to what he thinks this guy. So he hears about these murders happening again. And he's like, well, I got to get there. So we follow this. This cop's a douchebag. He does. He's just, he's just not a good cop. He's just very ineffective, very douchey. And just 
unlikable, to be honest. Like, this guy, I mean, he's not a poor actor. He just, his character sucks. He's dumb. He, it really doesn't go anywhere. I don't know why he's here. So, um, I, I don't know if it's padding or what. So, we follow him trying to figure it out. But we also follow a girl who's about to be married. And, like, you know, so, like, the, sto the killer's stalking her a lot. Of course, no one believes her. Why would you believe somebody when they tell you somebody's stalking them? I mean, whatever, you know. So, like, you'll see these moments that are just directly lifted from Halloween. Like, she'll look out the window and there's, like, this strange killer standing by a bush and then they're gone. It's just like, are you fucking kidding me? Are we doing this? Like, and I don't care about ripoffs, but it's so close. It is so much a ripoff. Like, and I, I never registered that. Like, when I watch Terror Train or I watch Prom Night, like, Prom Night to me is Halloween and Carrie. But it's not so bad that I'm just like, oh my god, that scene's lifted. This one was the first time, like, in a long time that I watched a slasher where I know people would probably uh, mention Offerings is supposed to be really rough about that. I've never seen Offerings. But, like, uh, just where I was just like, man, this is so blatant. Very blatant. And I don't, I, I'm not going to hate a movie for it, but just, it just makes me laugh, to be honest. I almost find, like, a layer of entertainment in picking the parts that I'm just like, that's lifting from. That's Halloween. That's Halloween. That's Halloween. But uh, there is one really great set piece. There's a couple good set pieces in here, um, one of which is kind of like where she drops her wedding dress to get gr cleaned and everything, or she's picking it out and somebody gets murdered in there. That's a good scene. And, of course, I think I, I would be uh, um, doing this movie a disservice if I didn't mention the fish tank. I mean, the fish tank's probably one of the most memorable. And, of course, it's a very early, if not the first role from Tom Hanks. Did Dungeons & Dragons come first? I'm not 100% sure. Maybe that was 79. I don't know 100%, but it's a very early role for Tom Hanks. He's witty. He's eccentric. He's fun. Um, but, yeah, there's a couple murders in here that are, are fairly well done. There's some nudity. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's not a perfect slasher movie. It's not the worst slasher movie. It, it's entertaining enough to get you through. Um, it's a good director, though. I mean, like I said, he had a handful of horror films, uh, some of which are interesting that I do enjoy. Um, so, yeah, um, he knows you're alone. You could do a lot worse, but just don't expect uh, anything out of the ordinary from this one. Now, the killer is very much out of the vein of like Slumber Party Massacre, where you're like, who's it? He just looks like a crazy guy who hasn't slept in four days and has been jerking off. Um, I don't. That's how I imagine the guy from Slumber Party Massacre looks when I when I picture him like I he just looks like he's very tired and very horny and this character is kind of in that same vein um or maybe even the guy from Nightmares in the Damaged Brain where it's just like you boy you need a nap I, now you can see like after like putting so many characters like that in horror films to kill people they started putting them in masks like we we're putting you in masks man like we, we just and then we use stunt guys we can do whatever the fuck we want these intense guys that look like they need to rub one out we don't want we don't want that no more but uh anyways I don't mind either if it's the killers in a mask or he's not in a mask whatever the fuck anyways this is an all right film like i said i wonder if it has any features i didn't watch them which was shitty of my part but new interviews with director armin uh mastriani producer robert d'amelia writer scott parker and actor don scardino um audio commentary with uh the director and scott parker as well and i should mention uh don scardino is in another film from 1980 and that is cruising um, didn't do as many movies as I expected at him popping up in both of these. Um, more an interesting character in Cruise than in this one. So yeah, uh, yeah, and the ending here leaves it open for more poor brides or or would be brides being murdered on their wedding day. <laughs> so he knows you're alone. Okay, the next one from 1980 is from 88 Films. This is from the Shaw Brothers Collection. This is actually an import, and this is Hex. It says, before Ring, before Dark Water, before Shudder, there was Hex. So this one uh, I definitely wanted to check out. Uh, from the director of uh, The Boxer's Omen, he did a handful of other horror films as well. And, uh, yeah, so um, I can't show the back. I might have already showed it. So, anyways, Hex. What can I say about this one? So right off the bat, it's, it's a period piece kind of deal. It's very Shaw Brothers. It has like a nice set with a lot of, you know, like ponds and all this kind of shit you would expect. And there's a there's like a lake that's there, of course, or a big pond that's kind of a set piece here. And uh, what we have here is um, they kind of set up everything, this family history. And they say that this woman, you know, she came from like a rich family. They become kind of poor here and she's struck ill. And she's been forced like a man was kind of married to her family. And it almost seems like he's like there. He treats her like he's in debt to her yada 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 she has like tuberculosis from what i can tell and he this guy has scared away all the servants and he just beats her beats the servants he's just an all around round piece of garbage absolute trash bags so what happens is uh one day this servant shows up this this former you know a daughter of a former servant and says you know i feel like i'm indebted to you my mom swore by you i said you were the greatest person ever your family so she says i'm willing to you know volunteer help you guys out here um and whatnot. So what happens is uh, 
I guess somebody gets revenge and somebody ends up dead. Um, and then that person comes back to haunt them. And I don't want to spoil absolutely everything here, but there's some fun special effects with like, kind of like bloated bodies and, and weird shenanigans and kind of cool lighting, if I'm not mistaken, here and there. And I like the water aspect and everything. But before long... It turns into a gaslighting story, which I'm so sick of, especially by 1980. There's just shouldn't be five or six gaslighting horror movies in the same year when it's such like, and there's nothing wrong with gaslighting in horror films or gaslighting in thrillers, especially like film noir. It's kind of like what you expect and, and those kind of like old style thrillers or hammer thrillers, but 1980 and we have such a cool like idea and ghost story and set piece. This is like, why are we doing the fucking gaslighting thing in this movie? It's really just kind of blah. But um, what happens is there's a couple twists, actually, and it's just like, that's not what it appears. This doesn't appear. It gets really weird and wonky, and then we enter this other twist, and then, like, by the end, you're just like, I don't know whether to <coughs> approve of all these ridiculous twists because they keep doing them, or just be like, this is just so much. It's just getting stupider and stupider and, like, whatnot. But the ending of the movie you get to see like these rituals performed and you know later like the movie like the wailing would have these kind of cool rituals and dances and stuff like this but in the wailing it wasn't performed by a completely nude woman with the kind of the weird the, the tattoos they put on there and they do do the kind of thing like um what was the um geez i can't believe i'm gonna forget this classic um uh quite like quite on where you have like all the tattoos and everything like that but with Hirochi the earless right um, it forgets the ears to put the stuff on the ears and we have a, kind of that play into it, the, the thing right because the spells and if you ever seen like Chinese movie ghost stories and stuff like that they have these incorporated these spells and a lot of Asian ghost stories and stuff and they do that kind of stuff but the character does this ritualistic dance for like five ten minutes completely dude and I was just kind of shocked that they you know showed all that kind of stuff and it was definitely like a welcome change to the movie like just a, a you know cool dance and the explicit stuff and, and then being completely nude and, and shaved bald with the tattoos. I was like, well, this is different and this is cool. And I, I think if the movie had more of this kind of stuff, it would be a, definitely a welcome presence in there. And as far as like the movies, it's not a horrible movie. It, I'm glad I watched it. I'm glad I checked it out. And I think there's some two more related movies to this series. Uh, Hex versus witchcraft this is the same year. I'll be watching that for this. And then I think there's hex after hex. And I think those three are a loose trilogy. Somebody correct me if they do know, I'm not a hundred percent, but as far as the special features are concerned, we have, the studio that conquered a continent in introduction to Shaw Brothers with Bay Logan. Uh, and then we have Hong Kong language movie with Bay Logan. So there we go. Um, like I said, we're checking out if you're into the uh, Asian ghost stories and stuff like that. You could kind of see a little bit where it came from. And the ending is awesome to watch. I just didn't expect to see that. And it was a, is a welcome change for sure. Okay, next up. It's kind of a sci-fi movie, uh, but it has horror aspects for sure. And uh, I had a real weird experience with this. This is the first time watch. It's listed very high on like letterboxes for as far as popularity of the horror movies from 1980. And this is Saturn 3. Now, this is a movie I'd never actually seen. Oh, I just noticed it has uh, music by Elmer Bernstein. So that's definitely a, uh, a positive there. Um, it stars Kurt Douglas, Harvey Keitel, Farrah Fawcett. Those are really kind of the only people in the film uh, for uh, a longer period of time than five minutes so this takes place in the future and apparently there's space stations where people are isolated and all around you know the universe or the galaxy and um kurt douglas and farrah fawcett um are on this place called saturn 3 it's kind of isolated no one really goes out there the very opening of the movie harvey Keitel, named benson kind of wanders in and he's all dressed to the gills dressed in a space suit and he's in like this kind of departure station and this guy's talking to him very casual and says you know you know that you didn't pass your psych test who gives a shit don't try to fight it i guess if i knew i was going to saturn 3 yada yada so we we know that this character in this suit is, is out of his mind he opens the gridlock this guy ends up flying into like this weird kind of this shield where he's turned into like shish he's turned into like swiss cheese he's just completely depleted and harvey Keitel ends up going to saturn Saturn 3 anyways. Now, on Saturn 3, we have Farrah Fawcett, who's 36 years old at the time. She's never been to Earth. She doesn't know Earth. She doesn't know really how things work, and and they've been isolated. Kurt Douglas is 64 at the time, and they're, they're a thing in this movie. They're completely isolated in a weird way. They're like hippies, but they're also traditionalists, you know, the kind of staying together, only one partner deal. But it, it, you, f you start to get this weird vibe. I did at least. That was very dated. It's like 64-year-old Kurt Douglas. I know he thinks he's too old for her, but at the same time, he's like, I feel like he's taking advantage of her. So Harvey Keitel shows up, and I feel like he's dubbed. Like, I... I I don't, it was very strange. You know, you, you expect Harvey Keitel to have that thick, you know, Bronx accent. Um, you shoot that man, you die next, Harvey Keitel. It's not. It's very 
uptight and weird. And he shows up and he's just very abrasive, very by the book, very unhinged, which is obviously what he was. So he's not supposed to be there anyways. And like right off the bat, you start to learn the differences between, you know, uh, how they live and how the modern world lives. And you feel like they're living uh, in the modern world in a dystopian place where it's so strange. Like here she has 64 year old Kurt Douglas, you know, basically with her and their relationship. And then Harvey guy tells younger. Right. But he's just like, I'd like to use your body. And she's like, what? No, I'm not interested. And it's like on Earth, that would be penalized, penalized. And it's just like, you're like, oh, God, this is just a this is a nightmare for Farrah Fawcett. And I started to have a nightmare for her. Come to find out, Harvey Keitel's there to program this robot. So one of them will become obsolete and they can be separated, of course. And this robot is going to take up one of their daily duties. Think like Silent Running with Bruce Stern, right? He has his little robots. But except that those little guys were cute. This fucker is not cute. He is like a big like sturdy muscular thing but then he has these weird short circuit johnny five eyes coming out of him very chintzy and weird looking at top of that but then he's like this big juggernaut body it's so strange and weird and like at times corny but at times unsettling it's a weird mixture of unsettling dystopian sci-fi and corny cheesiness that's dated so like i don't even know where to think of saturn 3 okay so essentially what happens is um, Harvey Keitel is supposed to program this robot and they basically talk for a while and you learn that it's going to come directly from his mind. He can do it in three weeks. They're also at uh, a total eclipse or something like that. So their communications are cut off. It's like, fuck, it's getting, the stakes are higher. So what happens is Harvey Keitel becomes obsessed with Farrah Fawcett because she obviously doesn't want anything to do with him and that drives him crazy. So um, he starts to program the robot, but every time he puts his mind, his shoes in, he's trying to teach him certain things. The robot's picking up other things that are, are in Harvey Keitel's mind. And like and you can tell this weird moment where the robot starts to like learn on his own and like go beyond what he's supposed to learn. And it's really uncomfortable. So like at this point now we have Kurt Douglas who's in love with Farrah Fawcett. Harvey Keitel wants her and this robot who's become obsessed with her due to having Harvey Keitel's thought process. And of course, like at this point, the robot thinks that he deserves Farrah Fawcett. It just gets real fucking weird, you know, kind of hardware style storyline, the Richard Stanley film where like the robot goes bonkers but it's different because the robot has like this aspect of wanting a human being like it's just a weird film uh as far as the end moment is concerned how it's filmed is pretty damn cool um there's a couple moments of gore um and like it, it feels like at times you know people are going to compare it to alien which came out was released a year before you can see that but also more stuff maybe like a 2001 because we have this sentient um robotic creature you know kind of turning against them and we would have this in other sci-fi films later down the road, like Ex Machina and just Terminator. All sorts of ideas of this, you know, artificial intelligence somehow taking that next step in reasoning and just destroying you, right? I mean, like 2001 is, is pretty much the, the the one that you think of, right? Where it understands its flaw that it made and it has to co take care of the people that know about the flaw because otherwise... And, like, I can see that, like, the thinking and it just starts to kind of bend your mind. Um... Like I said, uh, I don't know how to feel about Keitel's performance because he's dubbed, and it's a weird thing to do. And I don't know if it's his own voice, but he's just very stern and dickish. And, like, his character was very abrasive and weird to me and, and unsettling, which is a positive. Kurt Douglas seemed at times perfect for it because he's, like, this old guy, but it's also very Kurt Douglas. Like, oh, yes, you know, he came a little bit, like, he, he crossed the line to, like, the, you know, Charlton Heston I love, but Charlton Heston can have that, like, cheese-tastic, like, yes, anyway, you know what I mean? Like, Charlton Heston in Wayne's World acting. Like, and I don't, and Kurt Douglas is a classic actor, right? And he, he's always like trying to like push himself in physical, physicality stuff. And sometimes it, you know, you're like, oh, you can, you can take your hat off towards it. But at other times you're like, this is like 64 year old man trying to do somersaults on the ground. And it just looks like a 64 year old man doing somersaults on the ground. Um, Farrah Fawcett's good in it, you know, and the robot. The robot's a star, right? Like I say, it's a scary ass fucking robot. And also at, at one point I laughed hysterically at the robot while being simultaneously afraid of the robot because it repairs itself and it's this big elaborate scene where like it's getting into the computer system and building itself back up and you're like oh shit and then like it's like Bow! and you like see those stupid little johnny five eyes and you're like <laughs> like I, you're gonna kill me but i'm gonna laugh at you first so this is a weird ass movie like i said and i enjoyed it like it was just bonkers it's it just unsettled me in a weird way that i don't know why um, I went to like a midlife crisis thinking I was Kurt Douglas or something. Like, I don't want to be old. I don't want to be Kurt Douglas. Um, but I, I mean, it would be Kurt Douglas because he has more money than God. Um, and he lived to 108. I don't know if it was a good life. But before that, before he was in a wheelchair, I'm sure it was great. I mean, that guy's a movie star, right? Um, 
So basically, as far as the special features are concerned, we have interviews with screenwriter, special effects artist uh, Callan Chalvers, and actor Ron Doltris. Um, and it looks like there's a, another commentary on here, but they're not listing. The interviews with the special effects artist I like because he talks about the kind of end scene, the big explosion, which I liked. Anyways, it's a, it's a bizarre film. And uh, remember, during a game of chess, there's something that an uh, alien can never, uh, a robot can never understand. Sacrifice. Okay, so now we're going to hop into a couple Hammer House of Horrors, and the first one up is going to be The House That Bled. Um, yeah, so anyways, I'll be very brief with these. I don't have too much to say about them. They're like an hour long, right? So The House That Bled, um, this is one of my lesser favorites, I, I would say. The opening is great. We have this really messed up scene where like an old couple is in this apartment and like or this little kind of house, and the old man like poisons his wife, and I just was bothered by it. It was really kind of well done. There's these kind of blades on the wall that are obviously going to get some use later when he cuts up the body. We cut to like a few years later, or maybe it's, it's very brief after. We have a family of three, you know, a wife, a husband, and a young daughter moving into this house to kind of have all this kind of stuff going on. And like, of course, it's immediately haunted, but it starts to have the more hauntings when a neighborhood, a neighbor comes over and they, the two neighbors and stuff like that, it becomes more amplified. So they start to blame her. And we have all these kind of weird, spooky things, you know, a pet dies, very typical, right? When you see a pet in a haunting movie, like that pet's, he's done, he's done, he's out of here. Unless it's Amityville and then, you know, dog's all right. Uh, or even poltergeist. Anyways, a, a low-hanging fruit, you're going to kill the animal in a lot of these movies. So, of course, that happens. Um, and, and, like, we kind of go through the typical haunting stuff. And then at the very end, there's this bizarre reveal. There's some moments I do appreciate, you know, spraying a bunch of kids uh, during a birthday party with blood made me laugh. That kind of made me chuckle. Um, I'm a sick man. But, hey, I got a dark sense of humor. It's pretty funny. And then, like, the very end, and you're like, okay. The twist is just like whatever like i know it's like oh it's crazy it's, it's, it's almost like it's like we can't do what anybody else did what are we gonna do something really fucking stupid okay let's do that i mean i guess it's set up okay i just didn't care for it and i just don't know the point it just didn't do much for me and I, I know i'm being a negative nancy it's not the absolute worst thing ever but it's just i don't know i just don't buy it it's a lot of it's a lot of uh uh just accepting to to get to that twist and it's just really not worth it so that is the house that bled not not my thing Okay, the next one uh, is Growing Pains, and I, I remember this cover art for sure, if anybody says that jester on there. So this one I liked a little bit more for sure. So we have is uh, a family of three again, and they're kind of well off, and the mother kind of does a lot of things where she goes like and helps like poor uh, kids in different nations, all this kind of stuff. She's very much, a, what is the word I'm looking for, uh, like a human humanitarian. And the husband is working on, you know, curing uh a hunger around the world, world hunger. And he's doing this with a special chemical off a of plant, yada, yada, yada. At the very beginning, their son tragically dies uh, due to the lab. Some weird thing in the lab kills him. He ends up hallucinating and he kind of falls out of the window and he, he ends up dying. Uh, we cut to them adopting a kid and uh, the kid's very strange, Jimmy. He's very weird. He's very cold and distant and just a bizarre character. On the way home, uh, from the orphanage, they almost crash when they go by the the cemetery you know, and see that, you know, it's that's where their son is buried, all this kind of weird stuff. And before long, you know, the dog starts acting crazy um, and and the ghost of their son is around and you don't know his motives at first. And then you kind of get these reveals and you're like, oh, shit. And uh, there's one character that is from like kind of like a humanitarian cause of the world hunger and stuff from Africa that brings up a death trance and you kind of get in that aspect too, which I liked. And, and you can kind of put that in the same aspect as like, um, two evil eyes, the George Romero, uh, the, the strange case of Dr. Voldemort, where he's like I, being kind of hypnotized in a death and you're kind of stuck in this weird kind of thing. Like, a, a like I said, a death trance and it's different, but it's there, but this kind of weird limbo, um, where this character would be. And I thought that was a nice touch. I thought it was a little different. And I thought that it was a, a kind of a crazy one that I actually did buy in a weird kind of scientific, kind of crazy bizarre way but uh this one i think is worth it I, I think it's worth checking out this one this is growing pains uh different than where i thought it was going to go but i enjoyed this one uh as, as, as kind of i would put in the more the upper of the hammer house of horse so far and i think i have five more episodes to check out so yeah all right we're here for you ain't seen and this is kind of i think the final heavy hitter that of 1980 that i'm going to cover that's not um with like somebody else like as a special so this is dario gentle's inferno um you had never seen inferno so that's definitely why I wanted to check it out. The second in the Three Mothers trilogy, the first being Suspiria, which is probably Dario Argento's most popular film along with Deep Red. Um, the series was over with um, the uh, Three Mothers, which came out many years later. 
So uh, initially, this one uh, was made in 80 to follow up Suspiria, and it, it didn't do as well as Suspiria. It's kind of a letdown. Uh, 20th Century Fox put it out, and it was kind of like a shelved, and it was very strange. So like after that, we never really got the completed trilogy until years down the line, which is funny because he released Tenebrae, which means darkness, which is actually what one of the three mothers is. So um, this one is, is very much in line with Suspiria. We follow the witchcraft. And the first one, we have the mother of size, who's Suspiriorum. This mm -hmm. one, we're going to follow the mother Tin Tintiri Bronium, well, how do you say it, Tenebrae, the mother of darkness. So all three of these mothers, they, they break down the uh, mythology a lot more in this one. So um, And it's about an hour and 50 minutes. It's a little longer than Suspiria. I think they're probably around the same length. So essentially, we follow a character who's in Rome, He's, uh, I believe he's a, a music guy. Is he studying music? Yeah. Or he's studying music, which is a very typical uh, Dario thing to do. And he gets a, a letter from his sister, who is in New York. And she has apparently stumbled across one of these places where these witches live. This is based off like an old tale, uh, kind of like an old tale that uh, Dario Nicolodi um, was actually very familiar with, and that's how he uh, uh, Dario initially made Suspiria and whatnot and everything like that. And she's actually in this film as well. So, in the very beginning, we actually have that scene where um, uh, the main character's sister goes into like uh, that the weird uh, the water area, the over flooded place, mm -hmm. which has got to be one of the most uh, incredibly filmed, terrifying scenes ever, where she drops her keys a into like a room below that is flooded with water. This gorgeous room, and, and she encounters a dead body. But uh, yeah, it, it, they kind of explain everything in here. Any place that's around these kind of uh, um, I guess residence where one of these three sisters and three mothers lives is kind of corrupted by evil and insanity. And that's essentially it. Um, and we're mostly focused on the mother of darkness here. So witchcraft and weird things ensue. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, lots of very, very great moments that I'll get into later. So that's kind of the plot and the setup. Um, and of course, doesn't have Goblin or Claudio Seminati doing his score as Keith Emerson. Uh, a very good score, very mm -hmm. a little different but similar, but still excellent, very memorable. So, what do you think of this one? Um, I think that like like plot wise, I think it's far more developed than um, Suspiria is. Uh, I think the you know the original Suspiria like like is like visually stunning, but when it comes to like the actual plot of what the three mothers are and what's going on, I think I feel like it's just really vague vague and underdeveloped and, and I, I do think that that's a, a problem with a lot of our gentle stuff is yeah I, I think he, he tends to shoot a lot of like vague like conceptual stuff in, in a lot of the movies i've seen with him um this one though like while the plot is i think a bit more fleshed out the idea of the, of the three mothers is more fleshed out i will say that like it does suffer from like an overall lack of a main character um in the sense that, like, you are introduced to characters, and you're probably with them for 20 minutes. And then they're... And then... They're you, done you, for. You know, yeah, they're, they're done for. And so, it like, like, like the focus kept shifting, um, which which wasn't a bad thing, but but it... Well, the locations keep shifting, too, which is cool. So, the locations like, you can do, see that the... Lo sorry, the locations yeah. would shift with the characters. Yeah, but but it almost has this, like, like, like air of almost being, like, an anthology in that case, where, um, just like, like, um... The house that drip blood. It's it's like you have this central manner, if you will, and then you have these different characters now interacting with it, um, and, and and they meet their fate. It's it's the same thing. Different people come across the story of the three mothers, and they're done. And they're done. Um, for it. I love that the book is like a big part of it. Um, yeah. The book that they're always constantly looking for the book and finding the book and. Like, that's kind of what, like, brings about, like, their doom is they start to learn a little bit too much. And, like, mm -hmm. you never really see the killer. The killer is always in shadows. And, like, you see their hands, though. Right. And it's, like, these long, disgusting hands. And if I remember correctly, I think that Suspiriorum, she had the weird, gross hands, too. I, I feel like because they, they yeah. show her... I don't think they ever show her fully, but they I think she is, like, veiled in one scene. I, I, you mean Suspiriorum? They show her at the very end. Oh, but do you show at the very end? I can't. I can't remember. It's yeah. been so um, long. Just, but I do remember her. Her veil, and you do see the yeah, hands. And I think it's hands. when all the girls are sleeping. Well, they also do the. I think the, the, the hands silhouette. come through through the window. Yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. But yeah, the hands here are definitely uh, a cool thing. Um, and uh, this one, they definitely use more familiars. Like in the other one, mm -hmm. I think more people are kind of like following the witches and everything like that. This one, you have a lot of the cats, and wherever the cats are, they're like their eyes, they're spying, and they really do really well with the cats, and they set up this. Uh, this 
this kind of like antique guy who has the books in mm. his demise his whole setup is perfect and and his the way he we're gonna spoil this the way he dies when i was young i was always like why did that like hot dog like vendor kill him and then you're like well it's during the eclipse it's during the mother of darkness's most important time right mm. during an eclipse and on top of that they're right by her location so it's just like yeah, everybody kind of goes mad with that. And this one, you know what? This is going to be a reach. There, it's kind of in a similar vein. Hear me out to Prince of Darkness. Like, I could just see a that. little bit to me. And, and also, I would definitely put the male lead in Prince of Darkness and this in the same caliber. They're in two excellent movies surrounded by mm-hmm. excellent things, and they're both very standard. Right. And, and, like, not horrible. They're fine. They're just very bland and boring in comparison to everything around them. And Argento was never really great with his male leads. I think he, he gave better to his female leads, if right. that makes any sense. I don't think his male leads ever... I mean, like, um, the uh, the actor in uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage, they're fine. They're fine, but they don't stand out as much as the female leads, like Jessica Harper or um, his daughter, of course, Aja in, in Stenhall. I think that they just have more to do, or maybe he relates, or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always going to be hard to replace Jessica Harper. Um, Agreed. I, I, I mean, you know, she, she's one of my favorites. Um, I will say that it, it also gives me um, vibes similar to, like, like, the Beyond. Yeah. Where... And again, it's oh here here's a location and certain things are happening and, and this random character dies and he's really on natural right, circumstances. Right. Of a, the Beyond's um, the funniest though because it's just like I'm in the library. I love I love I love the, the, I love the Beyond. Come out, you're like, <laughs> but why? I, I mean, I love the Beyond too. Like, and, and I would I know this is gonna sound really weird. I you know you know the two, the Beyond and City of the Living Dead. And then Inferno and Suspiria. Like, all four of those. I know people are like, well, how saw they by the cemetery is part of the trilogy? It's not really part of the trilogy. And then, and, and again, the, the third mother or three mothers is whatever. But I feel like those four movies share a lot of the same DNA because mm. the nightmare logic. That's kind of like coined the nightmare logic in those movies. Like, why? Right. But it's just, I don't know. The more I see them, the more they make more sense to me in their weird worlds. Like, I don't have a problem with, like, any weird shit that happens. The, the Beyond is one that has the painting in it, right? The yeah. painting of the apocalypse. Yeah. yeah no, like that. That. And, and how that. We're just not reviewing up. Beyond here. Yeah, um, we're, we're going back to Beyond. I mean, uh, so so Inferno, <laughs> like, um, the end set piece has got to be one of the coolest things ever. Um, mm-hmm. Her whole speech, the whole reveal with the mirror is really cool. Um, and they do, we do know Mario Bava supposedly shot that underwater sequence, and mm-hmm. it was like the last thing he shot. Um, and you could tell that the dude just was like a jack of all trades. Like, you're like, I can't do this, get Mario Bava. Then Mario Bava died in 19 years. <laughs> like, what are we going to do now? And we could, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, Lamberto Bava was assistant director of Mario's son on this and stuff. And that started a long relationship. I mean, I'm sure they were working together before that. But I'm just saying, like, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a damn cool movie. Daria Nicolodi's good in it. And she's like, the, the way that she just comes down and like reveals herself is super bizarre. Like she shows up like 45 minutes into the movie. Doesn't she? It feels like like 30. I don't know the actress. Name. She's the one, the neighbor from upstairs. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. And you feel like in the original Suspiria, most of the characters that were around that were adults were involved somehow right. with, you know, the, the coven or whatever you want to say. And this one, um, it's like the characters are well aware of strange happenings, but they're directly not in it. Like you even have one of the actresses from Suspiria and Eyes Without a Face. I can't think of Valda or however her name is. She's in this, but she plays like a different character. And her demise is just fucking batshit over the top. Like everybody, almost everybody in this movie's demise is like, we're just going to take it to the next step. Like if she falls through a burn, you're just like, what the fuck? I like it, but it's just like, whatever, man. Um, the, I think like that there was a discrepancy in in who the witch was um the, so the main character the, the man that's studying music um there's like a very significant scene with this woman with a cat and i don't i thought i was led to believe that she was actually going to be the... well she was in italy yeah she was in rome right yeah. right well while, while, while we're talking about the mother of darkness who's in new york right you know so so i mean i i for whatever reason i thought that, that she was the witch um because she has like two or three scenes and then she like disappears like after the first 20 minutes of the film well, she she's like definitely distracting him mm-hmm. and she could just be a regular witch or she could be the mother of tears which right. i i don't think so i think she's just kind of like a witch how the the one witch was in like suspiria the, like there's all the yeah. coming she's distracting her so she can get that letter away from him oh and, because uh, they do not want him to know yeah, yeah no yeah. i i understand the, the function of what she's doing in the plot but i think it it's 
again with with Argento and like like the vagueness of some of the things that he's writing. It's it's that she's never really explained or delved upon. He goes to New York. And... I've watched so many of these movies that that doesn't even bother me. I've made so many logical steps for these movies, and I think like that's just after you watch them enough, you just kind of accept that. Well, you have to. Oh, um, I do find it very funny that this guy wanders through the movie blindly almost like an mm-hmm. idiot and everybody around him is figuring out more shit and dying like right. his sister the the girl who likes him the neighbor all these people are like one step ahead of him and dying for it and then at the very end he like all the pieces are put in place for him to discover that uh and Valeri, he never gets the, it. the Valeri the guy who constructed all that which is a really cool idea to have him involved to kind of right. tie it all that together and his, him being alive in a uh, Fyodor Mm -hmm. Um, Fedor, I guess this is a more appropriate pronunciation. The actor is in the church as well as what is the weird Joe D'Amato movie. Um, it's one of the Emmanuel's black Emmanuel's, but it's not really a black Emmanuel. It's one of the renamed black Emmanuel movies. He's in that as well. The only two other movies I can think of him in, but he's really good in this too. And, and the part where he has to speak in the thing and he, <laughs> and he's in yes. like, he's like, I don't know why that's funny to me because I'm sick, but mm-hmm. it's that, that's just some like weird little sadism, sadism touch that Dario put in there. Do you like it better in Suspiria? Yes, I do actually. Um, but you know, I'm also I, I do like the remake of Suspiria more. But again, it's it's one of those things where you have this neat idea, and I feel like the remake I think realizes it a bit more, goes further with it. Um, but the cool thing about this one is it, it it discusses all three of the three mothers. Yeah. So you like you get a sense of the world. Like you real. I really wish he would have had another one. See, and and that's that's after. the thing. Like like the idea of like the three mothers, these three witches that are you know like like like. Like, this is the stuff I really like. So, you know, where the original Suspiria falls flat is that it's just kind of... There's nothing flat about Suspiria. I'm just saying that now. For me. Well, I mean... It's... I like them about the same, to be honest. I like this and Suspiria relatively about the same. But, you know, it's it's like... I think that the original Suspiria, yes, it's a, it's a visual treat. Yes, the acting is amazing. Um, But it's just like the actual core of the story and... and... It's a little light. It, I understand. It, it's very light. And again, I, I do think that like with most Argento things I'm watching, it's Argento is making some fantastic set pieces, but he is very light and touch and go on the story. Um, not, not always, I don't think. I, I mean I you know, I'm I'm thinking of Suspiria and Inferno, Inferno Opera, Opera, um Phenomenon. Phenomenon. But I feel like they're more I think Suspiria and Inferno are the most batshit. You know, no, but the stuff is definitely bad shit. But but I'm talking like narratively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, plot I'm not focused. Argue that. Y- yeah, I, I'm it's... not also the guy to go to for what finds narrative be able to follow narratively. Right. Because look at the shit that I watch. Right, I, I watch right, movies right. Not subtitles and try to figure it out. Like I think I know what happened here. It's like you don't know what you're talking about. And and then and, and my my biggest complaint with Argento has always been like like plot wise, he's he just doesn't care about the plot. He he is. He, like he, he loves the set pieces he loves the technicality i think of making a film um but it's it's i think why well, I, I tend to like favor more fulci because i think fulci really does get into the plot and then i mean you think of like romero romero really does get into the plot and most definitely character well um, you're missing a huge part of what these those directors all do um Argento likes to dive into themes yeah. and certain ideas within his movies that kind of like make up for a lack of plot sometimes. Right. Like when you look at, you know, the reason and motives for the killers and, and, you know, like they have like gender politics and stuff like that in his movies that I think are endlessly entertaining. Not so much in Suspiria and Inferno, I would say, but like his, his more straightforward giallos. And as far as Fulci is concerned, he always tackles these issues as well, mm-hmm. you know, about superstition and all that kind of stuff. And, right. and just people being a complete, bastards and their superstition and being punished for it and all this kind of stuff and and while romero is more of a guy who directly just comes out and says what he's talking about and no one else really was doing right that. so and they're, they're very different to me all three of them oh all three of them but i would say that argento and fulci share some of that nightmare logic of course and like you could see bits of pieces that dario put first forward mm-hmm. that were popular that end up in fulci films right and and and, and what bava put forward that end up in Argento and Fulci films as well. And, you know, but like, if you look at like our Fulci's Jolly, like 
he always said that he i know we're getting on a tirade he wasn't inspired by argento he was inspired by guys before argento right. making him so you know and and his his giallo gialli before like lizard of woman's skin and and don't torture a duckling and stuff they don't feel like argento at all no no not, them, no not at like, all they're no like his but, movies but but that, that that was i think has always been though is my, my biggest criticism of argento and i'm speaking only of argento is is that the plot the narrative structure has always been the back style show. over substance that's See, right he's a style guy over right substance. and, and then not saying that there's no substance it's it's specifically the plot and it, it's either too contrived or non-existent um and it, it's not like they're broken plots but so 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 again going back to like what you're talking about like you know this or suspiria you know with, with the original suspiria again we're introducing this theme of the three mothers and you know like like this really conceptually cool idea and i, I like it and i like oh i'm really going to like this and in the original in, in the original suspiria it doesn't really go anywhere the, the the mother isn't really a significant yeah she's she's a significant force but she doesn't have like like a like a presence in the film like like an actual her presence is invisible her, almost she has an invisible director, presence she, you know, she she has influence but she doesn't on, have she does she, she doesn't have i feel like true presence versus in the Suspiria remake, she has a presence. Well, I don't want to argue that. I, oh, no, no. I, I, let I, me get back to Inferno here. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going back to okay. Inferno. Okay. Yeah. You get to talk for 15 minutes. Go ahead. Hey. Do it. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, like I'm just trying Go. to interrupt me. <laughs> but so when I'm watching Inferno and yeah, the, the plot points are, are very disconnected. Um, And like <laughs> I said, it's very an anthology like. Um, I do like it a bit more because the Mother of Darkness is, I think, a bit more present um well, i like her better than the mother of size too oh absolutely i mean it's a cooler name well no superiorium is a you is, can't is, beat is, mother of darkness no no <laughs> but, but hands down the coolest one but and i forget the actress who plays her um uh, she does look really familiar i mean and she is yeah introduced a bit earlier but you don't um, know she is the mother of darkness, no you which don't, is also no. a nice touch which again is going back to the whole like like that witch in rome who had a far more significant would you think that the remake of Suspiria took from Mother of uh, from from uh, Inferno just as much as it took from Suspiria? Oh, it had to. I, it had to. Like, like I and I think that's where I do like the remake. It, it is again because it it just enriches like this folk. And you know, I I am unfamiliar with this Three Mothers folktale. I don't know if it's made for the movie, if it's based off of some older no, folktale. No, Daria Nicolodi, I think, brought it to the table that it was actually something that was established right. with her as a kid or something that she knew. He, he, no, what, 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 what's this? Daria Gentu's longtime partner. Oh, she so she was she aware of this before. She brought it to Argento for okay. Suspiria. Yeah, yeah and, but that's the thing. I don't know... I've, I've never done the research of what the three mothers was but i'm not sure if, if it's very common like everybody knows maybe argento knows too or if it's she like wanted regional to dive into it. or let me get to the point about inferno yeah versus suspiria yeah so and i would compare this too if you have no problem with the beyond or city of the living dead's lack of logic when it comes to that you should not have a problem with inferno as well or or something like prince of darkness because those movies basically set forth what is happening for the reason of insanity. The Beyond says the gates of hell are open. City mm-hmm. the gates of, all bets are off. If tyrannosaurs are gonna crawl out of some fucking abyss and eat a librarian's face, so be it. That's hell on earth. Right. Apparently. So when the Inferno opens up and says these buildings were constructed here to cause madness, and anything around them kind of gets taken into the madness, and we have the eclipse coming, which so when weird shit happens in Inferno, you kind of have to forgive it in the same sense that you forgive it in the beyond. Right. Now I can understand your complaints of Suspiria because that's not established. Like the opening of this one establishes all this stuff. You have oh, Larry yeah. telling all this stuff and it's almost kind of like, wow, this is so bizarre. And it's weird how this movie didn't do well when it came out. I know it's not very approachable, but it's got such a good fairy tale quality to it, which Suspiria has as well with the young girl going. And in Suspiria, they're supposed to actually be kids. They're supposed right. to be like, Which would have, I think, been more effective, but then mm-hmm. we don't get Jessica Harper. So fuck it. Let's have Jessica Harper. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um did you notice that's why the door handles are like really short and stuff like it, oh, is it? It, okay. it, it did a lot of weird shit but they made them hollow, tall whatever suspiria's got a lot of stuff but i'm just saying that fairy tale quality is in inferno as well and i i like them about the same you know maybe i think i i think i put suspiria higher just because it's impact and stuff but i love inferno i think it's cool i do think maybe at sometimes it does feel a little long so if you're in a, like a little bit more of a tired mood, maybe, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think it's boring ever. It's, it's pretty fantastic. I, I will say that, um, to compare it to another, uh, 
duet of films where that also have Jessica Harper in one of them. Rocky Horror is the more important film. But Shock Treatment, I think, is the better film. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I like Shock Treatment better anyway. But oh, me too. I don't Absolutely. think it's better, though. I no, just like it better. That's I, all I can... You know what I mean? It, it's probably technically not better. Just like Inferno is probably technically not better. I like it more. It I think it's better. Impact. But definitely Suspiria is probably the more important. Let me read mine first because it's literally two sentences. Okay. Almost like John Stanley hadn't revisited Inferno in 20 years <laughs> and he didn't want to. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I don't even watch Inferno. Fuck that movie. <laughs> so, John Stanley's Creature Features, Inferno, 3 out of 5. And Italy's Dario Gentu, famed for Deep Red, is up to his usual writing, directing, scare tactics in this tale of witchcraft. Suspended animation and other supernatural delights set in New York apartment where a gloved killer stalks. Mario Bava was credited with some effects. Irie Miracle and Lee McClowski. Key. Um, what a shit review. That's it, huh? Don't even bother writing in it. Okay. Well, I've already read mine, and I think mine's actually pretty good. James O'Neill, Tarot the... Tape. James O'Neill's the guy to go for for right. horror. He's better with horror, for sure. And John Stanley's more of a sci-fi guy, I think, so... I how like come I always, How come I don't get the sci-fi book? I feel like I should have the sci-fi well, book. Like sci-fi initially, more. you actually started looking through reviews, and these were more wordy and usually longer. Yeah. So you said, I want the James O'Neill tear on tape book, and I just got stuck with the wordy <laughs> shit to make me look even dumber than I already am. <clears throat> Inferno, three and a half out of four. The blank star means... um. Yep. Okay. Don't, don't know how to read this. Argento's follow-up to his masterwork, Suspiria, is a subtler... More subdued affair. Poetess Miracle investigates the history of her pink and violet New York apartment building built in homage to the powerful witch Mother of Darkness and is brutally decapitated for her trouble. Later, Brother McCloskey... Is that his name? McCloskey. McClos- no, it's McCloskey. Later, Brother McCloskey arrives from Rome to avenge her and nearly suffers a similar fate. Again, he's not avenging her. Um, He has no idea what's happened to her. Investigate her is the word. And that's yeah. his last name. That's his actor name. That's not okay. his name in the movie. He's okay. not fucking McCloskey or some shit. All right. Oh, so he arrives from Rome to avenge her and nearly suffers a similar fate. With its non-linear, dreamlike plotting and vague, insubstantial characters, this is more like a series of lush set pieces than mm. an actual movie. A fact that may have prompted distributor 20th Century Fox to shelve it for five years before finally releasing it direct to video. Wimpoid Lee is the weakest hero in the Argento filmography, and much of the action is frustratingly vague, but see it for the haunting visuals, like Miracle Swimming Through a Flooded Ballroom, the last work of the great Mario Bava, and suspenseful setups like the rat attack on crypto <laughs> bookseller <laughs> Pitoa. <laughs> <laughs> Keith's book examples on how to make a good atmospheric horror film. Music by Keith Emerson. I just laughed when you said crippled. Like, that's how I, fucking you stupid know. I am. No, I, I just love that because he's like, they're eating me! The rats are eating me! <laughs> it's really fucked up part. Like, he's drowning cats in the river and, like, he trips because he's got the crutches and he starts, like, drowning and all the rats attack him. And, and then, like, the eclipse happens and, like, some, like, he's like, help! And, like, you see, like, hot dog vendor run over. You think he's going to help him? And he's, like, running from a distance. He's come over. He's like, oh! <laughs> just kills well, that, that, him. That's, like, the most, like, frustrating thing is, is the whole cat drowning thing because, um,. This man can barely walk. He's got, like, polio or something, so he's on crutches, and he's carrying this bag, and he walks into the lake um, to drown these cats. The water is up to the man's ankles. But he's pushing them down, like, too, with the bag, so they're, But like... he's throwing the bag... He's not throwing the bag out into he the lake. He did a little he, bit. He, he is throwing it, like... A foot in front of him. There is, you, and then he he picks it up again and realizes he's got to go further, and that's when he trips he keep, in there. He keeps on doing this, and and it's like you know he's testing the depth of the water. The deepest part of the water is about three inches. You know, the average height of a cat's about like I don't know, you know if you nine. know this, but toddlers drown in puddles sometimes. You know, toddlers do, and you know if they drown in pickle buckets. Um, what's a pickle bucket? Like a bucket that you get a bunch of pickles in. It's not um, a thing. That's this not is a thing, thing at all. That's not a fucking thing. <laughs> but anyway, I thought that was some weird colloquialism. I didn't know, but that's not a thing. <laughs> I, I work at a restaurant. Um, you don't work at a restaurant. I used to a long time. There's ago. There's no such thing as a fucking pickle bucket. When you get a bunch of pickles, they come in like a ten gallon bucket. So ki- a bucket. toddlers drown in ten it's gallon. A jar. No, it comes in a bucket. <laughs> you never even work in a restaurant. No toddlers ever drown in a pickle bucket. Yes, it's, it's no, happened once or twice. Never I have seen it with my own very eyes on at least four separate occasions. I drowned that kid in that pickle bucket. <laughs> Brined in vinegar. <laughs> okay. Um, no, no, so it's like, but like, he's trying to like stuff his bag full of like 20 cats in like 
three inches it's of, like of water. It, but it's frustrating. You know when you watch those videos of like people doing things really poorly and just kind of like it's like what is this? He is crippled. Yeah, but he's not like redacted. Um, but like he. Doesn't he have, like, a bathtub in his house? Couldn't he just draw the sack of cats in his, like, home well, He doesn't bathtub? want to then have to carry the cats out and get rid of the evidence. He just throw them in the trash. What he should have done, if he was smart, here's how you kill cats, guys. Um, just feed them some antifreeze. Yeah. Or, actually, he should have thrown a rock in that bag, so when he chucked it off the bridge, they would have just sank. Or just, like, hit them against the damn wall when they're already in the bag. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, there are well, a million... We have a crematorium. You want to burn them? <laughs> There are just burn animals ways. alive. That's ooh, it's hideous. Like, it's like, so like, 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 at least let me take them out in the parking lot, take them out of their misery. I, I, I don't think one that of your, would work. Your idiot things, Sorry. like, 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 a, like, a, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, but no, it, it was just like so frustrating. I'm like, what is this man doing? You, you think that this man is like, like some like intellectual genius, collects rare books, you know, is aware of all, you, you know, he's an asshole. And, and like, 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 I'm going to try to like. I won't even stand over the bridge and throw the bag in. I'm going to walk out into the middle of Central hey, Park. You don't and... ask your doctor to change your oil in your car, okay? You don't ask the antique owner to drown the cats. Because <laughs> he obviously doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, no idea, no idea. <laughs> Anyways, I love this movie. Uh, four and a half out of five, nine out, nine out of ten, whatever. It could, it could be a ten out of ten. I, I just don't really give a shit. It's high. It's a high movie. It's think. a high movie. I'd say it's easily a four out of five maybe a four and a half out of five it's first time watch for you too yeah yeah it's first time watch um, technically i mean like we're talking like i don't i we always compare fulci and argento i love them both well the, argento's movies are technically they're just more expensive they're 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 gonna appeal to you know an artsier audience i think for the most part but fulci's i think are a bit we just like fulci i like fulci it's and fulci. i like fulci as fulci, a person fulci, fulci. Um, even though he's probably a terrible person i but. eat the dirt because I cannot eat you. Right. Okay, so what are we watching next week? Um, I guess we'll watch uh, part three of the anime vampire. Uh, Whatever it's called. Yeah, Kizumono. Is it Kizumono? Why are you asking me? I, I, barely, I can I, barely I tie my shoes. I type it, so I just assume since he I still it. do the dumb way to tie your shoes with the loops. Don't ask me nothing. Yeah, he can't tie his shoes. I can't tie my shoes very well. Kid can barely read. Kid can barely read. <laughs> <laughs> just today, Junior. Right. We're done. That vampire right. thing. Bye. We're finishing it. Okay, let's get into these questions, answers, comments. And last week I asked you guys, um, what was your favorite stolen shot in a film? Most dangerous uh, stolen shot in a film? That's what I wanted to know. And, you know, guerrilla-style filmmaking, like Larry Cohen's infamous for that kind of stuff. So uh, let's get into this. So what the flick? I love Silent Rage. I just bought Chuck Norris, Hero and the Terror, in hopes it will be as good. Also, I feel like God told me to would be a great remake with all these mass shootings happening. It would just hit hard. Lastly, if I remember correctly, Tom Savini blowing his own head off a maniac was a pretty ballsy moment in guerrilla filmmaking. Nick Mua. Finding decent and dangerous stolen movie shots is more difficult than one would think. I'll give it a whirl. Mad Max, a shot where Johnny the boy breaks a chain on the payphone. Allegedly, May stunts were done sans permission, and no walkie-talkies could be used to communicate between crew and cast. Mad indeed. The ever uh, beauticious Carolyn Monroe in the Cannes Film Fest red carpet scene during the shooting of the last horror film. The infamous uh, Ripley Xenomorph meeting in uh, kind of David Fincher's Alien 3. I heard a studio wanted to shoot Mr. Fincher into space. Cary Grant walking up to the UN building in Mr. Hitchcock's North by Northwest. Questions. How do you come up with the question of the week? Magic 8-Ball, a hat full of questions. Do you have a bud-type zombie you've trained to grunt? I just randomly come up with it. Sometimes I come up with it on the spot. Like right now, I don't have a question of the week. Might not ask on the YouTube. Might have to ask on Facebook only. That happens sometimes. Um... And then we have, would you watch a zombie movie set in a haunted house? Why not? I mean, Dead Dudes in a House is kind of a zombie movie set in a haunted house. Um, was that one from uh, they did uh, Tales in the Crypt episode, right? Where it's kind of that deal where, like, uh, was it Morton Downey Jr.? And he ends up going to the haunted house. Um, where are we at? <laughs> Basically, I closed out of the thing. I've been using uh, my uh, tablet, uh, my Galaxy tablet, instead of using the um, printing off paper every week. I'm trying to save the environment. And also, it's just a waste of ink and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. Um, and also, he asked uh, a scary cartoon. Off the top of my head, do I, I know a scary cartoon um, that actually scared me? I think that under certain circumstances, Pink Floyd the Wall could really mess you up. Um, if you know what I mean, under certain circumstances. A cartoon that scared me as a kid. I know... Um, the uh the three witches um not the three witches that um the one with the old uh um 
the the three kids kind of go into the woods. It's a very witch story, and they, they tell them not to. And the kids have this whole elaborate story where they like stay in the witch's house, and she's like, "Who is awake? And who is asleep?" And it's like the littlest one is awake and it's like narrated by this old lady that was a scary ass cartoon as a kid um it was well done though like in the, in the aspect it was very you know kind of um t- story just to warn you uh, warn kids and stuff very much you know fairy tale kind of story good one uh, i don't remember what it was actually called so that's my answer um okay um so i really enjoyed the review of the amicus anthology film cool ilk vomit my comment from last week wasn't read out loud on sub he's kidding um i i must have skipped it on accident or you didn't get it in time well, i said basically whatever i record these on friday i'll read it again love humanoids from the deep i believe it's still here on youtube watch for free i always put it on the break room for at work fun fact simpsons character voiced by legendary phil hartman troy mcclure is partially based on doug mcclure doug mcclure found the homage funny as children called him troy mcclure when his back was turned jesse diaz i have always loved god told me to it's a mixture of everything horror sci-fi black exploitation everything the part of the movie that always freaked me out uh was all the people who consciously who, who are consciously not there like when tony lo bianco's character asked the man why did you do it why did you kill your wife and kids the guy replies nonchalantly because god told me to jesus christ creepy very creepy um that, that stuff's very unsettling um hey man rip um rip to lq jones i thought he was going to stick around forever always loved him and stroller martin as pals and wild bunch or bow to cable ho for indeed you know i recorded that and then like two days later he had passed and i was talking about you know lq jones i would have mentioned it then obviously but rip lq jones great character actor in a bunch of movies um always very funny in the sam peckinpah interviews very blunt very true um and just seemed like an honest honest guy good guy too seemingly I mean, I don't know these people. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I mean, he seemed like a great guy. And uh, he says, I know you're a peck and paw freak like me. I mean, who doesn't love peck and paw? Bad people, that's who. The Maniac. Ah, yes. Blockbuster, the Hitler of the mom and pop video stores. Forgive the bad joke. I don't know if this counts as guerrilla filmmaking, but I have to go with the flipping stunt from Road Warrior simply because it wasn't planned and the guy almost died. I would say Roar is the most dangerous guerrilla movie because nothing was really planned. The actors just had to work around all these lions. D. Gulag. Love this channel. Thank you. VHS uh, 82. A bit of trivia on your review of The House That Drip Blood. Jo- Joanna Dunham. Segment Method for Murder. Guest star with Peter Cushing, Segment Waxworks, on Space 1999 Missing Link episode. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Peter Englund. It's just weird when you recorded this video. LQ Jones is still alive. R.I.P. LQ, for sure. Uh, Kentucky Kentuckinator, another R.I.P. LQ Jones. Ken Coakley. I was lucky enough to see The Exterminator at a drive-in. And with uh, drive-in with Escape from New York and Exterminator 2. At a hard top theater the weekend it came out. There were supposed to be uh, at least five or six installments. One of the rumors was the second one, Dalton, Christopher George, would survive and the exterminator would work with Dalton. I thought that was an interesting take, but George passed away. Ginty did too because he was promised that he would extermin- would direct Exterminator 3. The actor you were thinking of from the original Friday the 13th and Austin of the Corpses was Erwin Keyes. Yeah, I, I knew his name the week before. Sometimes I forget his name occasionally. He says, Who am I had the pleasure of meeting at Rock and Shock? We talked about the, both Exterminator films, and I asked him if he was the same character in both movies he said he was. I asked why he did, uh, he did, but the leader played the net. Oh, wait. I asked why he did did it but the leader that's a misspelling or a missing something leader played ned the burning eisenberg didn't survive oh that was ned eisenberg in that oh i didn't register that that was uh him in the first exterminator i didn't uh eddie from uh the burning ned yeah yeah ned uh he's eddie in the burning he's an asshole and i love the burning's my favorite slasher by the way um didn't survive he joked that he was the lightweight the keys and robert ginty worked together again in monsters tv movie a friend's father met Ginty in Chicago in 79. They had a mutual friend. Ginty had already been in Coming Home as Bruce Dern's army buddy. Ginty told my father's friend that he had just been hired to do an action film, which was The Exterminator. I also have this movie from Arrow, which was a very interesting interview with Glickenhaus. Glickenhaus said that Christopher George was offered the role in Deliverance that Burt Reynolds ended up playing, but George's agent didn't tell him about the offer. He was a TV star in the 60s and did a few films with John Wayne, who thought highly of George. Yes, I've heard that as well. Also, Glickenhaus said that the title Riff, uh, Ryle, was offered to Joseph Bottoms. The title Ryle was offered to Joseph Bottoms, who wanted too much more money. He also said that Steve James auditioned for the bartender role. John Eastman's best friend was originally written for a Latino actor, possibly Edward James Olmos, but James got the role. Steve James is awesome in that movie, by the way. RB, my guerrilla style filmmaking knowledge is lacking to say the least, but would Raging Bull count? I know the boxing scenes got out of control multiple times and people were getting hurt pretty bad. So then we have Dustin Mills, the chase scene in the French Connection. Barry O'Connell, the bridge jump and deadbeat at dawn, no doubt. Um, Nick Dame, the shotgun uh, shotgun headshot and maniac. Josh Schultz, Nick Dame was just going to say this. 
Um, and he also says the entirety of the last horror film, aka Fanatic, Jeff Keith, Apocalypse Now, John Sullivan. Any stunt from the end chase scene in Mad Max 2. Stuntmen still recovering from past sense were literally putting down crunches to attempt the next. Pat Lynch, the driver. Marcus Cook, the brain, uh, and brain running around naked through skin deep. Uh, Matthew Hudson, since Dustin Mills took the best answer, in my opinion, I will say the train scene where the step almost took out the top of Eli Wallach's head in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and it is a decent contender. I might have been thinking of a car chase in a French connection. I don't know. Dan Tatilla Herzog having a fucking boat pulled over a mountain is a god tier. He told the army he had a permit and gave them a forge one. Maybe anything, Herzog. Grizzly Man? Zach Puccinelli? Pretty much all of Jackie Tan's stunts and a lot of Charlie Chaplin's stunts, if I'm properly understanding the question asked. So basically, I meant a permit, you know, stolen shots. You don't have, you know, you don't have, you're not allowed to be there. So this week's question, um, let me find out when, when was the, I don't really have a question. Maybe I'll think for a minute and then just cut it in here. Okay, here we go. What is the most ridiculous mistake in any movie you've ever seen? Like a boom mic or, or just somebody saying the wrong name? What is the most funny or ridiculous scene uh, mistake you've ever seen in a movie? There we go. There we, let's do that. Let's hop into that update. All right, guys, let's hop into this update. First up is Forbidden Love, the unashamed stories of lesbian lives. So, uh, yeah, I, I usually kind of read and, and pick and choose on the uh, partner label stuff. I don't get them all. I mean, it gets very expensive, you know, Canadian international pictures. But this one must have caught my attention. Thought it was definitely worth picking up. So, yeah. Next up is from Eggfa, and this is Final Flesh. This looks bonkers. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I pick up all the Agfa ones. After watching this film, I started drinking mouthwash on the rocks. Harmony Kareen. Oh, wow. Um, I feel like he probably was doing that already. But, uh, yeah, this looks weird uh, and bonkers, like all Agfa's titles. Uh, so, basically, I, I pick up all their ones. I, I think I'm only missing a couple, which is, you know, they're out of print. But, eh, maybe they'll come back out. Not sure. I don't know much about Final Flesh. This one here, Night Ripper. Um, I think I had an old VHS bootleg. This is Culture Shock. So another label that I definitely collect. They put out some cool stuff, some wild stuff here. Um, and I believe this one is, is so it's the HD up res from the original Video Master. I believe this was an SOV at the very least. It was only in the tape world, right? Um, I, I had a tape master. Maybe the elements were lost, but I believe that is an SOV. Then we have here Red Lips. This is the Donald Farmer movie. This is Saturn's Core, the twelfth release from them. I also collect all the uh, Saturn's Core stuff here. Uh, he has got some familiar faces on there for sure. You know, I, I've seen a couple of Donald Farmer's movies. I think his most famous is probably uh, Scream Queen or, or Demon Demon. Uh, what was the one? Scream uh, Scream Dream and uh, Savage Vengeance. He's got a um, what was the other one? Vampire Cop. He's got a bunch of movies. This guy's been making movies for a hundred years. Um, this one I have not seen. So hopefully it's pretty good. Then we have uh, Apocalypse After. We got Altered Innocence here. We got a freaking baboon on the cover there. I tend to pick up a lot of the Altered Innocence as well. Um, this is like this one just looks completely intense and, and bizarre. This is from the director of the Wild Boys and After Blue. Um, so yeah, I, I grabbed this one. Included films. There's a bunch of short films on here, so why not? Oh, this one I'm gonna have to censor a little bit. Um, this is a Jess Franco flick with uh, Bridget Lehehe in here. Ja, ja Brule da Part Out. Uh, I know there was a misspelling somewhere where everybody was complaining about it. Uh, Pulse video here. Maybe it's not on there. Yeah, here it is. It's There it is. Uh, so don't want to too much nudity on the back here. But uh, yeah, I'm a Franco fan. I, I tend to pick up all his movies. Um, can I show this front? I can't really show too much. I know this sold one sold out like lightning quick and everybody was like losing their mind. Oh, well anyways, I'm going to get flagged anyways for nudity. I don't even know if I'll bother putting that out there. Anyways, you know, maybe it'll just be an adult video. Uh, then we have Air Doll, which sounded interesting. This is a, uh, what is this company? Delagog or, or however it is. So like I, I tend to grab most of their releases too, because a lot of times they focus on strange Asian cinema and uh, Decalogue. I, I like the Asian stuff because uh, they just tend to do things completely different than, you know, a, a lot of other countries that I watch. So Air Doll sounds interesting. Um, yeah. And then we have Out of Order. This is a subculture. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, this actress here, Renee Sudajik, she's in a lot of the um, Scandinavian movies I watched, and she's really, really great uh, actress, so I was interested there, and also, um, this is a 4K, this one sounded pretty intense, 
It's kind of at first it's just a glitch, then after 20 minutes the fear sets in, and then the panic at lightning speed. I believe this is the one where a bunch of people get stuck in an elevator, and there's like kind of a crazy person going on there. So yeah, uh, pretty cool. I want to definitely check this one out. What year was this? Um, 1984. Half the time you order so much, and then it's like two months later they come and you forget half the titles. Um, that's what happens when you're old. Then we got um, this one here from 88 Films, Seventh Curse. This movie is awesome. I'm so happy to have a deluxe edition here. This movie is badass. Um, Chow Young Fat's in here. Just lots of great uh, action. It's weird. Monsters, just nonstop adventure. You know, like Indiana Jones meets monsters and craziness. That's what you get with the Seventh Curse. Um, then we have Lisa the Fox Fairy. This is a. Um, this is a Cauldron Films. Uh, this one sounded really interesting as well. Another kind of wild Asian film, if I'm not mistaken. So I tend to pick those up. Yeah, and that's pretty much the update. Let's get back to the video. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Me.